Thanks, y'all, for being here. I'm going to start a little early, just with some ground rules before our next speaker comes on stage. Thank you all for being here. You're sitting in the optic room. You have found the place. I hope you guys get comfortable. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. A couple other ground rules you should know. Um, we will do some Q&A after each presentation. There should hopefully be somewhere between five or 10 minutes to do so. But each speaker will be doing a meet and greet after their talk. Now, if they're a sponsored speaker, they're going to be down on the expo floor at their respective sponsor's booth. And if they are a B&H guest speaker, we have tables set up right outside in the hallway. So that's also a good place if you don't have a chance to ask your question. You can go over to the meet and greet table or just tell someone how much you love their work or how it's changed your life. So I certainly encourage you to find the people who have been inspiring you, ask them the question that's been burning deep inside. Um, and you can see them over at the expo or at the uh, speaker meet and greet table right outside. So. Our next speaker, and hopefully you all know who you're here to see, Amy Vitali is a Nikon ambassador, National Geographic photographer, writer, speaker, a documentary filmmaker. She is going to show you some of her work, and hopefully you guys have lots to, to ask and lots of notes to take and lots of inspiration to soak in. So without further ado, Amy Vitali, please come hit the stage. Thanks. Thank you. It is so exciting to be here. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. So I'm curious, how many of you are uh, photographers? Is everybody a photographer in the crowd? Filmmakers? Any filmmakers? OK. Um, interested in wildlife? Good. All right. <laughs> well, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you uh, for B&H for putting this on. And, and I'll also be at the Nikon booth after at 2 o'clock giving a slightly different talk if you want to catch up there. But um, I, you know, I know our industry is in, um, you know, going through tremendous change right now. And I actually want to, if there's one takeaway from my talk today, I'll, I'll give a few stories. But my takeaway is that it is in these moments of transition and change, these tumultuous moments, that are the best opportunities um, to reinvent and to reimagine and to find um, a better way of doing things and new ways. So um, my work is really rooted in documentary work. and. I know with, um, I'll just open up with this conversation of AI and you know, there's so much conversation about what the future will be. And I actually have um, so much excitement because I think that there's gonna be such a great need for um, authentic, truthful, I know we use that word a lot, but really um, truthful storytelling and people are hungry for that. And I also never doubt the power of photography. And I really want to start um, today, which picture is on, with a friend of mine's picture. This is Steve Winter's photo. Do you all know who Steve Winter is? He's this incredible National Geographic photographer. And I want to open up with a story about this image and the power of one image to truly make incredibly powerful change, um, positive change. Well, he had um, this dream to take a picture of a uh, cougar in front of the Hollywood sign, right? And um, the only problem is all the scientists said, well, there are no cougars living there, Steve. But that didn't stop him. He had the dream. So he set up camera traps, and it took him a year. And he surprised all of the world, all of the scientists. Um, and, and not only that, this image and his work about this cougar who was called P-22 is actually the catalyst for the world's largest wildlife overpass in Los Angeles. So there's these two habitats that were separated by 10 huge lanes of traffic, right? They were all getting killed. They couldn't cross. And Steve's image and his dream to create an image like this galvanized people. And, um, and it's been an inspiration for the world. So I mean, that is the power of photography. And it just, I want to you know, start off with this idea, though, it's not easy. It takes work. And you have to have that dream and believe in it and 
work towards it. And you know, since then, he's built a nonprofit around um, you know protecting all of these cats that are um, really struggling all around the world. And so he's a great hero to me. I really love um, what he does and the power of photography again. But I'm gonna back up a little bit and go back to one of the first stories I ever covered. And this was also a dream of mine. My sister was living in a tiny country in West Africa called Guinea-Bissau. She was in the Peace Corps. And then there was a civil war and I wanted to find out what happened to these people that were her family that she loved. And, um, and so on a whim, I was very much an amateur, I applied for a grant. And so that's another takeaway message for all of you. Like you just have to go out and try and believe a little bit in yourself. So much about photography is really confidence and you know, just taking a step, step by step towards whatever your dream may be. And I never in a million years thought that I would get the grant. It was with the Alexia Foundation. And much to my delight and actually sheer terror, I got the grant and I was like, oh, okay. So um, I, with a lot of trepidation, began to pack my bags. It was back in the film days, 100 rolls of film, um, one Nikon body, and one lens. I would never recommend just one camera and one lens again. <laughs> Don't do that. But um, I ended up, I thought I was going to stay there for two weeks. Those weeks turned into um, many more weeks and then months. And I ended up staying there for over half a year. And really, I didn't take many pictures. I really began to learn um, how the majority of people on the planet live, and it has transformed and shaped how I see the world forever. Um, there was no electricity, no running water, no doctors, and really no access to education for most of the kids. It was a very remote village. Um, I read everything I could before I went to try to understand where I was going, talked to my sister a lot. Um, and you know, I, I learned actually that there's these two popular versions of, frankly, the whole continent of Africa, right? You get the one version, war, famine, plagues, or the other, you can go on a safari and see exotic animals. Now, it's not that both of those narratives don't have truth, but what I discovered was something totally different that I hadn't read about, and I think we do such an injustice to not share these stories. Um, and here is a, a tree, it's a bontong tree, and, um, and they believe spirits lived inside of this tree, and there was this deep reverence to nature and the natural world. They understood that their very lives depended on nature for its outcome. Nature is really our supermarket, and we often forget that. And I expected the story to be about the recent fighting and the legacy and of that to permeate all of my photos. But what I discovered instead was the immense power by those who shared um, you know, th this connection to nature and, and their resilience. And it was, you know, it was a very different story than what I set out to do. And I spent my nights sleeping on a mat on the floor of a mud hut and my days working alongside the women. Um, I learned how to gather firewood and water and don't underestimate the power of just working with people and you know, just working alongside people, even if you're coming as a photographer, because I think that definitely changes the relationships. Um, and we didn't, um, you know, we didn't have much to eat. I stayed through the end of the dry season. I brought these two 50 pound sacks of rice and two chickens. And um, by the end of the dry season, all we had was one bowl of rice to share with the whole family and all the children each day. And that's where I truly began to understand what hunger um, felt like. And um, this is also where I learned that if you push yourself outside of your comfort zone, um, it creates empathy. And that empathy is the wellspring to creativity. Like, don't ever forget that. That is where all of the great images and stories come from. Empathy is the most important tool all of us can go with. Um, and you know, I 
told you I read everything. Research is so important to um, before you do any traveling, but um, I also began to realize how there's a danger in thinking you understand other people's stories. You know, that I realize it takes time and, and really the important thing is to take the listening approach and let people feel safe to share their stories. And once they do, the whole world changes. Um, and that is really the key, again, for me to great photography is when people truly open up and, and share what they think is important, not what you came and thought was important. And, you know, even everyday questions, um, everywhere I go around the world, everybody starts the day with, how did you sleep? Um, you know, if you have children, how are your children? That same series of morning questions, right? Well, in Guinea-Bissau, they would always end that series of questions with, did you wake up one by one or all together? I couldn't understand what they were asking. It took me a while. And finally, one morning, I figured it out. Because all the children, we shared this hut, and they slept nuzzled up against me. And if you woke up all together all at once, something terrible had happened in the night. But if you woke up one by one, you woke up to the gentle rhythms of life. And they were just simply asking me in their poetic way, is everything really OK? And I loved that. I loved, you know, once you learn language, even a little bit of language, um, it just opens up this whole new way of seeing the world. And I think you can look at these images and see how you know, vastly different they are from here in the world we may live here um, in. But um, that was not what was really surprising. The thing which really surprised me was how much we shared, how much we had in common. And on my last night in this village, Dembeljimpura, this is Alio. He loved getting a hold of my soap. And Alio and all the children were asking me a million questions about my return home to America. Um, you know, they, there was some sadness. We, they wanted to understand where I was going back to and, um, and wanted to feel connected, I think. And, and they were asking, like, you know, what is a television like? Because there were no televisions there. And do you have mangoes in America? Do you have cashews? And then Alio, Alio looks up, and there's a sea of stars and this big, beautiful full moon. And Alio asks me, do you have a moon in America? And I promise you, I looked at the super moon a little over a week ago. I think about him. I think about all those, my friends, those people that changed me, um, what they taught me. I think about them every time. And I've also thought about the moon a lot as a metaphor. You know, it's like this collective third eye and looking on us. And you realize that whether we understand it or not, we are connected in this beautiful, intricate web. So I left Guinea-Bissau, and then I actually kind of became a war photographer for the next 10 years. This is in um, Gaza. And um, you know uh, that was one of the first places I was sent during the Second Intifada. And in this image, the smoke you see on the upper uh, right-hand corner is a police station that has just been hit by a missile. And I should have been inside that building covering this unfolding story. But as I ran to get there, the batteries in my camera all fell out. And in that, in the seconds, it took me to stop and pick them up and put them back in. And I start running um, out of nowhere. A helicopter came and fired the missile, just vaporizing that building in front of me. And I was told to get close to the action, bring back the dramatic images, and I did that. That's what my editors expected. I thought that's what my uh, audience wanted, and it's certainly what all of my colleagues were doing. And on this one square block, there were a dozen photographers documenting the scene as it unfolded. And over time, I really began to ask myself this question, um, were we telling half the story at best, and at worst, was it even maybe a lie? Um, because there were plenty of other stories all around us, stories that allow us to relate to one another as human beings, stories that connect us. But 
we didn't tell those stories. And one day I was walking back to this hotel room I was staying in and I heard music coming out of this building. So I wander up these staircases towards the music and um, through this door, it's all, it's darkness. And then this is the image I see. This couple getting married in the middle of all of this chaos just captured my heart, this expression of love and hope amidst all the suffering around us. Stories like this really give us a sense that those caught on both sides of the conflicts don't stop dreaming and hoping for a better future. And what I found in that room on that day in Palestine was human resilience. And it's all around us. And I began to ask myself these questions like, what would the world look like if we began to illuminate not just the things that, you know, pull us apart um, and divide us, but also the things that really unite us and connect us as human beings. And so I'm going to flash forward because I did 10 years of covering the horrors of the world from you know places you've heard of, from Afghanistan to Sri Lanka, um, Angola, to places maybe you haven't heard of, like Casamance in West Africa. But I did that, and after about 10 years, I had this really profound wake-up call when I began to make this connection and really started to see that, you know, I mean, I was at this point really broken and raw. I took a break, and it was then I realized that all these stories I'd been telling about people and the human condition, at the backdrop of every single one of them, was the natural world. And in some cases, it was scarcity of basic resources like water. Um, in others, it was a changing climate and loss of fertile lands. But almost always, it was the demands placed on our ecosystem that drove conflict and human suffering. I mean, just to flash back, I don't know if you've been following the news, in the last six months, seven countries in Africa have had civil war. And I bet you in many of them, it is connected to resources. I mean, maybe not all of them, but it is the ongoing droughts. It's like, this is a matter for all of us to be concerned about. Um, and we also think it's something far away. I mean, yeah, we all know it. It's not, it's here with us now. But I can recall the exact moment when I began to really feel how connected we all are to one another and to all life on this planet. And it happened on this cold, snowy day in December 2009 in a village outside of Prague called, called Vrkralo. And it was on this day that I met this rhino named Sudan for the first time. And quite unexpectedly, this gentle, hulking creature changed the way I see the world forever. And what surprised me was the deep sense of wonder I felt. I felt like I was, you know, really in the presence of an ancient species. You can look at them and see they have been roaming the planet for millions of years. Ah, oh, rhinos, um, you know, just an incredible creature. But, you know, on this day, there were only eight of them. And if you can imagine, probably just less than 100 years ago, there were probably thousands of them roaming the planet. It didn't take that long. So there were eight known to be alive, all in zoos. Six of them were in the zoo in the Czech Republic and two in uh, a zoo in, in uh, the San Diego Zoo. And I was there because there was this crazy audacious plan to airlift four of them to Kenya, to Africa. And actually, they're not even from Kenya, but it was determined that Kenya would be the safest place for them. And at first, I thought it was a story straight out of Disney, you know, animals going back to Africa. But I quickly realized the tragedy of it all, that actually this was this last-ditch effort to save the entire species. They thought that you know, by moving them to the open air and room to roam, it might somehow stimulate them to breed. 
This is how we imagine wildlife roaming in the open plains of Africa. But this is what it looks like today. They have to be guarded around the clock 24-7 by heavily militarized men because the value of their horn is worth more than gold. Um, they're being poached to extinction. And, you know, I'm sorry, this is not just, this is a horrific image, but it's not just rhinos, it's elephants and so many species that we don't even talk about. Um, and when I began this story back in 2009, I researched, I read everything, and the, the story, the main narrative that I could find was, we've got to fight this war on poachers. We have to militarize, we have to kill the poachers. That was the main narrative. And I began to ask one really simple question. What do the people living with the wildlife think? Do they care about them? You know, very often we forget, but the people living alongside wildlife are the best protectors. And so I began to seek out these stories and ask that question, and it has led me till today to some incredible stories, stories that bring hope, that remind you that there are often solutions. This is Yusuf sleeping with another species of rhinos. These are black rhinos who've been orphaned. He spends 10 months of his life every year taking care of these rhinos day and night and just two with his own children and family. Can you imagine that? That is commitment. And I began to ask, like, why aren't we shining a light on these incredible stories? They're everywhere. They're all around them. This is Le Coupe and I, and he is the animal whisperer. Not one orphaned animal has died under his care, and he's rescued everything from warthogs to giraffes to elephants. He's amazing. And this is Kamara. He's with Khalifi, and little Khalifi would make these squeaks if Kamara like wandered away too far. The bonds are so deep, and it's a beautiful thing to watch that. But today in Kenya, because of a focus on local community involvement, stricter laws, and policing, the number of poaching incidences has dramatically decreased at a time when other African countries face rising poaching le levels. So during the pandemic, South Africa had 400 rhinos poached. Take a guess, how many rhinos do you think were poached in Kenya during the pandemic? Any guesses? 25, nope, I saw you, zero. Zero, I mean, that is amazing. And that is because the communities, the people, understand the value of wildlife. And it's not that people aren't trying, there's also policing. But I just think it's important to give, you know, when you tell a story, I'm sharing this story because stories change, they evolve over time. And it's really important as we go in to tell stories to really um, don't go in with the same script and think that that's the only truth. Um, it takes time and over years, like, follow, stick with stories, have one story you're passionate about and stick with it. And they always evolve. And I think that's when things get really interesting. And now I want to focus on another story um, uh, with another community in northern Kenya. This is Naminyak um, Wildlife Conservancy. And when I first began going there about 25 years ago, the wildlife wa was really um, hurting. It was being poached. Um, you know, armed criminal gangs were really terrorizing not just the wildlife, but the people too. And the people finally in this community, it's a Samburu community, and they said, enough, we need to start protecting our landscapes. Um, they understood that, for example, elephants are, you know, kind of nature's greatest eco-engineers. They rip up trees, it allows grass to grow, they find water with their tusks and dig it up, and, um, you know, they're like huge mobile composting units and really um, create a healthy ecosystem. And all these keystone species, without them, everything starts to suffer. And this community had a dream when I first met them back um, in 2013, and their dream was if elephants became orphaned, they wanted to create a sanctuary for them so they could rehabilitate them and then eventually return them back to the wild. 
everybody laughed at them in the beginning and said, you're crazy. You don't have any political power. You don't have the funding. Elephants are expensive to raise. And I met them and knew. I knew they would do it, and I stuck with them. And um, it's incredible. They are on uh, September 16th will be their, will be their seventh year. Um, they've returned 10 to the wild. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a big campaign for them because they're going to be releasing 13 of the babies I met seven years ago, six years ago, um, back to the wild. So it's this incredible story. And the other amazing thing about, two amazing things about this place, it's the first indigenous owned and run elephant sanctuary in all of Africa, meaning it's the community themselves taking ownership, caring for these animals. The second thing is it's the first sanctuary that hired indigenous women to be keepers. This is Mary Lengis. When I first met her, she was very much like I was as a young woman terribly shy, gawky, afraid of people. I asked her name and she would just look down and sort of whisper, Mary. And she has gotten so much empowerment and agency because of these elephants. She's so proud of what she's doing. She's been made the head elephant keeper and she, you know, is not afraid to speak anymore. And um, I just find it so beautiful because this story is so much more than a story about adorable baby elephants, even though they are. It's really about how people relate to each other and, um, and their relationships between one another. So as I mentioned before, Kenya is actually doing really well when it comes to, you know, changing that narrative of the poaching being the, the main thing issue for wildlife. Today, the biggest threat to elephants in Kenya, particularly in northern Kenya, is drought. It's climate change. It's these ongoing droughts. And so what happens is this is a well that in the day people use this well that they hand dug for their own livestock and for themselves. But at night, all the wildlife comes. But because of the droughts, the wells are getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And sometimes a herd of elephants will come around it and they'll get too close and a baby gets pushed in. Now in the past, nobody knew what to do. They'd take the baby out of the well and it would be left to die. But everybody has a phone and they know exactly who to call. And I just want to play a video because the sound of this baby calling out for its mother, we waited there for 32 hours waiting for the mother to come back, but it was haunting. It sounded like the cry of a human child in a way. Is there a sound for this video? was one of the first elephants that came to the sanctuary and it's it, it is actually so heartbreaking and also amazing how intelligent they are this baby knew we were there to protect it and it, the imprinting already began there were hyenas in the night you could hear them circling around the baby and it just stuck with us and um, unfortunately the mother the herd never came back and we waited and we waited, but often you can reunite the babies right there at the well, um, and they do. But in this case, Joseph here said, she's getting too weak, we need to take her back. But at least they have a place to take them back. And they, this is the most vulnerable moment when they come into the sanctuary. 50% of the time the babies die because they're switching from their mother's milk to this powdered milk formula made for human babies, right? So it's this very vulnerable moment. And they do everything. These keepers are up all night long, every three hours trying to get them to drink that milk formula. This is um, Dorothy. She was the nutritionist. Um, she's, she does many things now at Riteti. But um, you know, I just this story is incredible because during the pandemic, they got worried. They had to buy this expensive milk formula 
from South Africa and they thought, what happens if the supply chains break down? What are we gonna do, right? So they started thinking, we need to investigate if there's another solution to getting milk for the babies. They began to look around at nature. They were like, maybe there's a solution, um, you know, and they drink a lot of milk, by the way. <laughs> but um, they started to think like, well, you know, the goats, eat the same vegetation as the elephants. Maybe we should experiment with the goat, fil form, goat milk. Um, so they made this formula with the goat milk and began to um, make some studies. And it turns out, goats to the rescue, the goats work not only, uh, the goats milk, not only did it work, they went from a 50% survival rate to 98% of the babies survived because of the goat milk. This is such a powerful story for all of us because without this really terrifying moment, nobody would have had a reason to try to change the way they do things. So I just say to all of you, in, you know, just use it as a metaphor for all of us right now. The world is changing, but change your attitude. Use it as a moment to reimagine and do things differently. So the other piece of this story is also incredible. Um, the, you know, the babies are thriving. This is Mei Bai, um, who's like, I'm good, you don't need to feed me anymore. This is one of the elephants that will be going back to the wild very soon. Um, but there was another outcome from this story that was very unexpected and wonderful. So the women are the ones that own the goat milk all that money that was going outside to a huge multinational company is now staying in the community. And I went with these women as they set up the bank accounts for the first time in their lives. These elephants are giving them agency. They are sending their kids to school. They have money for when people get sick. It's absolutely transforming their lives. And people always tell me, it's not us saving the elephants. The elephants are actually saving us. And that is so true when you think about all the wildlife on this planet. If you really dig into every single story, we need them <laughs> way more than they need us. But again, this story is not just a story about adorable elephants, even though they are. It's really a story about all of us, our home, where we're going, our future. And I wanna share a trailer for a film. I did a little 10 minute film for Ritetti and um, I offered $10 downloads and we raised a quarter of a million dollars just with $10 downloads for the sanctuary. So here's a trailer. Shaba has witnessed the death of her mother being shot by the poachers. She was very traumatized. Shaba. Shaba. It is so sad to see them suffering. As Ambro, the elephants are our heritage. They guide us the way. It is really these elephants helping us. Before this, our community thinks that we cannot do this hard work to change a wild animal. I know I will cry, but we can't deny her the right to go back to the world. Chaba has always been a leader. And she's a female, which makes me very proud. And I'm so proud to say the American Museum of Natural History is going to be opening an exhibition on elephants. And they've opened a special screening room where they'll show this film. So that will be opening in uh, November. So go check it out if you have time. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. And now I'm just gonna quickly go through another qu a story that surprised me. So, you know, again, breaking through those stereotypes and narratives, the old narratives, like it's up to all of us to do more of that. Um, you know, China is not particularly known for love of wildlife or any, you know, great environmental stories, but that's not true. You know, I found another incredible story that taught me so much I was invited to be a part of a film crew photographing um, pandas as they were being released into the wild. Um, this is a panda coincidentally named Hope as she's taking her first steps into the wild. 
and um, I wanted to be empathetic, so I dressed up as a tree, as one does, um, and <laughs> hid behind you know, other trees so that she wouldn't be scared as she was leaving home forever. And the head of the pa uh, panda program, who is affectionately called Papa Panda, said, um, thank you so much for thinking about this panda. I really appreciate that. And you are gonna get to hold two baby pandas. I want you to know, President Obama, he only got to hold one. <laughs> so I knew there was like this special opportunity. And not only that, I got the bumper crop of babies laid out on a blanket. It was amazing. Look at the little guy in the back trying to escape. Um, so immediately I went to National Geographic and said, I've got this great story of pandas. And they said, sorry, Amy, we'd done a story eight years ago on pandas. And in that geo time eight years ago, it's like yesterday, you really have to like reimagine a different story. So I went back and read everything I could about pandas, so much that I felt like I was thinking like a panda some days. Um, and you know, what I discovered blew my mind. We have turned them into these cartoonish, clownish characters. You see them in Kung Fu Panda, you know, they're stuffed animals, but actually they are incredibly elusive solitary creatures. Mm, they, um, this surprised me, they were only very recently discovered by humanity. They hid from humanity for so long, thousands, millions of years. Um, they, you know, you look at ancient Chinese art and you'll see representations of other animals, other bears, bamboo, you won't see representations of pandas from the past. Um, they, they were only discovered first um, at the um, end of the 1800s very briefly, but the first one was only captured um, in 1937. That was the first one that was captured alive. So it's not that long ago when you think about it. And how do they do it? Well, they hide out in these thick bamboo forests, hidden away from humanity. Um, they really only come together to breed and a mother with her cub. But that's it. Um, they're very hard to see in the wild. And this is Papa Panda with his bumper crop that year of babies. And um, the, the crazy thing is they knew, the government knew that they were endangered and they said we need to have a captive population of 300 so if they go extinct in the wild at least we still have them. The problem is 30 years ago, they couldn't breed them. They couldn't figure out how to breed them in captivity. Zero success. They started doing everything. I'm not making anything up here. They literally brought television sets and showed them panda porn. <laughs> this is not a joke. They gave them Viagra. They tried everything. And then finally, it was Papa Panda, Dr. Zhang Himin, who figured it out. Two really important things. One. You know, you, um, the, the females only have 24 to 72 hours in a year to get pregnant. Not a big window. And two, you gotta give her choice. Don't put any old male panda bear in there. <laughs> give her choice. So they did that and now they have a very, very successful breeding program. This is what they look like when they're born. Tiny, blind, helpless, one nine hundredth the size of their mother. That is like me giving baby to giving birth to a baby that's like one ounce. Um, they are also one of the fastest growing mammals on the planet. They grew like little bamboo shoots in front of my eyes. Uh, it was extraordinary. And they smell a little bit like wet puppy dogs, if you're wondering. This little guy's like, I gotta get out of here. I want to be free. And um, so now here is where the story gets weird. <laughs> So I felt like I was in a Wes Anderson film every day. I got in my panda costume. There's like 20 other people zipping up their weird panda costumes, sometimes smoking cigarettes. Um, and here is the thing. Papa Panda had this idea. He's like, you know, we humans are the biggest threat to these creatures. They should never be comfortable around us, the ones that are going to be going back to the wild. So we had to wear these costumes, but as you all probably know, animals go by scent, not sight, most of them, um, certainly pandas. And so this panda costume was um, scented with panda urine and feces. 
And I'll tell you, I will do it a thousand times again just to get close to those animals. It was amazing. Um, but it was weird. I have to ask the question, who's the wild one? <laughs> um, and here's, they went through all these series of tests, a little bit like karate. You know, you have to pass each test to get let into a bigger and bigger enclosure. One of the most important tests were, do they run away from predators like leopards? So they would wheel a stuffed leopard into one of the enclosures, scent it, and if the baby was clever and ran away immediately to the top of a tree, she passes the test and gets into um, the next enclosure. But if she's curious and goes and sniffs the leopard, she fails and she's going to be in captivity forever. Um, so they do all these you know, tests like, do they know how to find the best bamboo? Do they know how to get leeches off? Can they survive in the wild, basically? And this is the biggest enclosure before they go back to the wild. And Papa Panda said, when they go back to the wild, he called it graduating to Harvard. So um, this story was amazing. I learned so much. You know, I think that, again, it's um, be careful of stereotypes. I, uh, I realized I met some of the most incredible conservationists on the planet who taught me so much. There, you know, there, there was so much to learn there. They um, are also, China is one of the few countries where forest coverage is growing because they're reforesting um, so many areas, connecting existing corridors for the wildlife to be able to um, move through. And um, yeah, you know, it was, it was really an interesting journey to, to learn that. They're studying our national park system. Um, so it's, it's really an interesting, um, story to, to keep going back to and, and digging in. And, you know, I think that for me, the great takeaway of this story was habitat. We must protect habitat. I live in Montana. Because of the pandemic, there's been huge, you know, urbanization and movement to these wild spaces. And I worry about, I watch the wildlife in our backyard getting crunched in. And, um, and I think it's so important around the world, we need to create spaces and really protect those wild spaces because you know without wildlife our whole ecosystem will suffer and um, I think m understanding that is so so important now I want to end with the northern white rhino what happened to them right you know they brought four of them to Kenya hoping they would breed well it didn't work and in 2018 I got a call to hurry back because Sudan is about to pass away. And this is the scene that I saw when I arrived. And the thing that I was struck by was this final moment between Jojo, his carer, saying goodbye. And Sudan was surrounded by all the people who loved and protected him. And there was this eerie, stillness that morning that was only broken by the muffled sobs of the people who loved him. And I think back often to this moment, and it is that silence that I remember most, a haunting silent silence that seems to foreshadow what a world without wildlife will be like. Today, there are just two northern white rhinos left, Najin and Fatu. They're both females. And if I imagine a world without these magnificent creatures, I understand we would suffer so much more than the loss of a species or the loss of the ecosystem. Actually, we are suffering a loss of our own wonder, our own imagination, our own beautiful possibilities. Think about how much inspiration all of us get from this beautiful world we live in. But the story has a hopeful twist. At a moment when it seemed like there is no hope, this small group of individuals banded together and are doing everything they can to save this species. And it is often in these moments of our greatest challenges that human ingenuity and creativity light a path forward. So this is the Biorescue Consortium led by Thomas Hildebrandt here, and they have already created 29 
pure northern white rhino embryos using the oocytes from Batu and the frozen sperm from several deceased northern white rhinos. Um, they're cryopreserved in a lab in Italy, uh, ready for future transfers to the surrogate mothers in a subspecies, the southern white rhino. And the team is also um, working to create lab-grown egg and sperm cells, and they've uh, generated primordial germ cells just from stem, stem cells, a, wor a world's first. But you know, here's the scene um, in an airport. Saving a species from extinction is a race against time. And while they're so close, like I am on the front lines, I've been going through the pandemic, go every few months to Kenya as they collect more oocytes, they're really close to cracking this but it is the smallest things that threaten progress. They have only 48 hours to get the oocytes from Old Pejeta, which is in northern Kenya, you know, all the way to Italy, to this lab. They have to fly commercial planes, and you know, it's like anything can stop them from um, a weather, you know, weather or delayed plane. Um, and here they are trying to get through customs as these valuable minutes are ticking by. So what happens next is in all of our hands. As we embark on this mission to save nature, there are amazing people out there. The truth is every single problem, whether it's climate change, destruction of forests, extinction, every one of these problems has amazing champions and they are often stymied by the simplest things. These stories I shared with you are about people living on the front lines of war, climate change, and extinction who refuse to let cataclysm define their future. And when I look out into this room today at all of you, I know there's an impressive group of people, right? And all of you have great imagination. You're all storytellers, and there are millions of storytellers. I mean, uh, millions of stories that need great storytellers. So if these people can do so much with just hope, ingenuity, resilience, and imagination, I just want to ask, what can we all accomplish together? And with that, I want to lead into what I did in um, the pandemic. I created a nonprofit called Vital Impacts. And what I realize is we are all so much better together, right? We have to come together to f solve our great problems. And so using great environmental photographers, some of the best that you know, names that are here, Brian Scary to, you know, just lots and lots, Steve Winter, um, so many of my heroes, um, um, and, and some kind of up and coming talent as well. We have print sales every year, and already in just, we've just turned two years old, we've raised one and a half million dollars that went right back into conservation to the people on the front lines doing the work. We raised $300,000 that were given back to the photographers to go out and keep doing that work. And we've um, created a mentoring program. I have a mentoring program in Kenya for 40 conservationists, and a mentoring program for 50 um, environmental photographers right now that I'm so honored um, that editors and photographers have all stepped up and agreed to mentor these people, the people that are the best in the business, helping you know foster that next generation because the world really needs more voices. At a time when media is struggling, we've got to find ways to tell these stories. They are more important than ever. And we've launched a speaking program that is live going into schools from fifth to eighth graders around the country. So it's all environmental storytelling to get you know, the next generation excited and to care and, and make them see that there are opportunities. We just have to go out and find them and create them. But here's a short little video that I um, made of the first thing. <laughs>
so follow us. We're going to be launching a new one for the Elephant Sanctuary. And um, I also partner with Jane Goodall. And I also want to give a quick shout out to Elizabeth Christ here in the audience. Sorry to make you embarrassed, but thank you because Elizabeth has been an incredible guiding light for us. And I, if there's other photographers and friends who've helped in the audience, thank you. Oh, Melanie Dunay, my old friend, is also in here who donated too. So you guys follow us and I'm here to answer a couple of questions. We have a couple minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Don't be shy. Any questions? Questions? Uh, raise your hand if, if you have one. Um, and also, um, Amy, you'll be down at the Nikon booth oh, shortly yeah, after. Can, so yeah, uh, go go pay a visit. Check out everything right. Nikon has. Um, you'll have a chance to see Amy again. And are you speaking at the Nikon booth? I'm too? speaking at 2 p.m. Amazing. So there's much more to see. A so different talk. Yeah. Any questions? Great. Hi. Yes. Microphones are coming. Hold up. Hello. I was in Wulong, so they have a center. I was in all of their centers, actually. Um, and, and there's one that is special for the rewilding program that tourists can't go to. But a good place to visit if you want to see things is called Bi Feng Sha. You can email me if you don't remember that. And you can actually, that's where they do all of the, um, the breeding, the breeding programs there. And you can even volunteer and shovel panda poop if you're so interested. <laughs> Amy. Yes. I've got a question here. Oh, yes. sorry, oh. yes. Sorry. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Very inspiring uh, presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank Two you. really quick questions. Did you ever go back to Guinea-Bissau? And uh, second, uh, second question, who ended up publishing your story on the, on the pandas? National Geographic did end up publishing the, the story on the pandas. They worked with me over three years to make multiple trips to tell all the pieces of it. So they were an amazing partner for it. Sarah Lean will be speaking today. She was the editor with um, Sadie Courier, and um, those two helped me to, to get that story going. And then I did go back to Guinea-Bissau 11 years later. And um, I need to go back again. It was actually, there was some progress in that girls were going to school, kids were going to school, and girls, which in the past that had not uh, been happening. So there was that progress, but there was also a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still very impoverished, and the world kind of turns its back on it. And actually, it's become this major drug corridor. So it has all these Bijigo Islands and all the islands around Guinea-Bissau. So drug runners have kind of used that as a base. So it's, you know, they've had multiple coups since then, and it's, you know, people are struggling. But I did go back and I met, you know, many of the people I knew had actually passed away at an um, unreasonably young age. Um, so, yeah, there, but there was, you know, there was hope. There's always hope, and there was some progress. But I think the world um, did turn its back on Guinea-Bissau. Ah, uh, <laughs> mucho pecado. Okay. All right, we have one more. Yeah. Over here. What do you go through the town when you're doing the Z9 story? Oh, great question. I am currently using the Z9, and I'm just starting with the Z8 as well. But I love it. It is a game changer. I mean, I shoot film and stills, and I really view myself as a storyteller. And it just allows me. It is so. It blows my mind what it does. It's seamless. It's you know really. Um, very intuitive. Um, my go-to lenses change for what I'm doing, you know, but if I'm doing street photography, I love the 24 to 70 2.8, but I mean, they've got a whole lineup of lenses that I'm kind of excited to go look at. They keep releasing them, but go check it out. I'll see you over there. Thank you all so much. Have a great time. Thank you, B&H. Thank you. Thank you. For